Dobro večer, još jednom dame i gospoda, dobro došli na Fair Connect. Uvijek na početku radimo ove da malo uvježbe, dizanje ruku, pa evo ovdje napravit ćemo to i na ovaj put. Ko u publici je prepoznao kompoziciju koja je bila? Nije upisivan broj, ali pitanje za vas koji ste prepoznali kompoziciju je zbog čega je baš ova kompozicija danas u Fair Connect? Dakle, radi se o novoj pjesmi Beatlesa koja je nastala iz stare snimke Lenana koju je napravio na analogni kazeti i nikako niti jednim digitalnim ili analogim filterom nije bilo moguće izbaciti pozadinski šum da se čuo razgovor u sobi itd. itd. i vjerujem da sad već pogađate kojom tehnologijom se došlo do čišćenja i na kraju kristalno čistog Lenanog glasa na koji su Mekartni i Star snimili svoje instrumenta, a naši su vjerovali u Mekartnu gitaru, mi ga snimljeno i sve zajedno ovo što ste sad čuli je uz pomoć umjetne inteligencije kriran novi hit Beatlesa. Vjerujem da mnogi od vas dijelaju na mišljenje kako se radite od najvažnijih skupina svih vremena, ali da mi idemo sad više u tom smjeru, krenemo sa današnjim programom. Kao inkluzivni fakultet i kao inkluzivno druženje prebatit ćemo se iz poštovanja prema našim gostima na engleski. Tako će cijelo predavanje i razgovor kasnije biti na engleskom, pa onda još pa imamo na koji se vrlo neće biti nikakav problem. Welcome to Fair Connect. My name is Mladen Bekovic and I'm the president of Fair Alumni Board. Fair Connect is gathering off, but not necessarily restricted to Fair alumnus. We are an inclusive society and we are uh, sending our warm welcome to everybody who a dedicated part of the uh, day to, to listen to exciting afternoon. Today with us we have a gentleman who uh, not only speaks about artificial intelligence, many of them do today, but actually spent most of his career working in a field. But not being very shy of controversy, his claim is that artificial intelligence does not exist. So obviously it's going to be an interesting far side chat with uh, Professor Dr. Chapa that is awaiting uh, uh, after the keynote. But to uh, respect not only the institution we are at, but also uh, the man who is the uh, creator of the, all this alumni board ideas and the initiatives as sponsor of the program. This is Dean of the Faculty of Academics and Computing, distinguished professor, Dr. Pedro Milas. Mr. Ambassador, uh, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I would like to extend my warm thank you to uh, the Embassy of uh, Republic of France in Zagreb for getting us the opportunity to organize this uh, event. I would like to thank a lot to uh, FAIR staff who really did a great job organizing this event and of course I would like to thank our alumni board and especially the, the part of it uh, that is related to organization of the uh, Fair Connect. Um, that's what we like to see. We would like to see a lot of uh, nice people coming to this faculty, getting together, uh, learning, networking and enjoying. Thank you for coming and uh, I would like to see you again, again at Fair. Watch a little bit of the, the technical details in the beginning um, to respect all those members of the audience that are referring to ask the questions in an anonymous way. Here is the way. Just go to the site, uh, take the code, and uh, the ladies here in the first row are going to take the questions, and your the questions will be read and answered by our guest today. Obviously, this does not mean that uh, all of you 
would like to take my, um, I'm not allowed to do it, it would be more than enough time to do so. So, um, let's So this is an awkward moment, it sometimes happens, so I will try to kill the time until we resolve this. Uh, and this is the, the story of oh, that. So, um, for all of you who are intending to run away immediately after the uh, presentation of the keynote, please dedicate a couple of minutes to the exhibition prepared by FED here just in front of D1, which is celebrating the science, uh, French science, and I honor and respect to, to our guest today. So take a look, uh, the artists are, are, are the best uh, artists, so it's going to be fun to take a look at. Um, but to, uh, allow me just a couple of minutes uh, uh, about the activities of Hormone and Board, because they are, I would say, socially responsible, and uh, I hope you will not mind if we just mention a couple of things uh, after the uh, gathering in June that was very much uh, about these activities, uh, walking uh, down the memory lane and remembering good old days when all of us were uh, young and beautiful. This time we are obviously changing it to the more of the content, being such a distinguished uh, speaker as we have today. But what happened meanwhile, uh, it's interesting to take a look at the photo of Fair International Alumni Board. Uh, happy people um, in a happy place. Uh, uh, they are going to help us in the activities to be able to share the international experience in the trying to reconnect our international alumni uh, the society with Fair, trying to reconnect uh, interesting uh, international perspectives in the industry in the same way as we are trying to do locally. So what are we trying to do locally? Uh, please, all of us, all of uh, alumni who did not register, you will have a chance to take a look. It's pretty easy. Just go to FAIR website. On the FAIR website, you will see alumni section. If you click on alumni section, you will see different subsections, which are basically describing what are we trying to do. And this is. We are trying to uh, strengthen the, the, the ties between uh, alumni community and, and faculty. But obviously, uh, not only that, it's about donating. It's about helping the students which cannot support themselves during the studies. So what happened meanwhile, um, the foundation is formed. And, uh, Igor Strechik here in the first row is the president of foundation. And uh, the foundation will contact you, trying to collect as much as possible to help the students that cannot support themselves. Please donate, it's a good cause. Uh, it's about mentoring. Uh, it's about fair and industry cooperation. I will show you how the mentoring was developing, but it's also about distinguishing two layers of cooperation with fair. One is, I'm the alumni, and I go to this, Side, it says register, register yourself. And I'm registered member of alumni. I'm passively contributing, trying to get as much benefits as possible. But it's also about AMAC. AMAC is association of the active members with more rights, with some symbolic fee. And what we did meanwhile, we have a new president of AMAC, uh, and this is Mr. Gordon Krekovic. Gordon, would you kindly just share with us what you have in mind for Yama in the next class? Thank you, Mani, and good evening, everyone. So, the idea behind AMAC, Alumni Fair, in the context of these alumni initiatives, is to gather all those uh, members who are willing to engage actively in different activities uh, that are related to the goals of uh, our alumni group and community. So, the values that we have, of course, are lifelong learning, uh, connections between um, the alumni community and FAIR, and also connections within the alumni community, as well as contributing to uh, building a positive image of uh, our expertise and our faculty as well. So for this reason, uh, within the association, uh, we want to offer additional level of um, uh, information
information sharing uh, of benefits for all members. For example, so uh, we will organize additional events. There is also possibility to have a web uh, with uh, actually an email address with domain of the faculty. Uh, then there are also benefits if you would like to attend conferences with a discount um, and so on. So now we are actually working on the new action plan and we are also preparing this list of benefits and the new website, but uh, you don't need to wait for that. You can already uh, apply and register to be a part of the association. Thank you. And, uh, the mentoring is not only about good idea, how to support uh, uh, students, how to support young talents in the early stage of career by the, by the senior engineers. It's also about the uh, IT solution behind it. The, for the good matchmaking, and this is what has been done uh, between two fair connects. Uh, how to uh, know more, how to get to know more, uh, subscribe to the newsletter. You don't have to be a part of alumni, just go there and subscribe to the newsletter. It's here. It's here. Uh, and then, uh, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you are going to get information about all of these activities, uh, you're going to get uh, information how to become either mentor or mentee. So uh, just stay in touch uh, because there are a lot of exciting new things coming in this new effort to strengthen the relationship between ex pairs and fair today. But let's now uh, um, skip straight to the topic of the day. And this is obviously about our guest. I'm not a managing these slides in the most efficient way. But what to, uh, how to announce the guest today? Uh, the gentleman we have with us today is a guy who oops, didn't want to make up his bed, so created a robot to do it for him. Uh, he graduated in one of the best technical universities in Europe. He been engaged, he's been engaged in, in leading technology companies in most senior positions. He is co-creator of Siri, that many of you use today. He was uh, a vice president for innovation at Samsung, and today uh, chief science officer of Renault. In a uh, career full of technology, full of uh, friendship with technologies that we today call AI. There is a gentleman who claims that artificial intelligence does not exist in his speech called Intelligence, uh, Intelligence Artificial Existed Up, Dr. Julia Sivoplan. Image, which is me with the Hawaiian shirt. I'm the only one again, but one day you will come to that. Anyway, um, so uh, let's talk about this thing that is, you know, artificial intelligence. So, uh, yeah, the, the slides are in French, but uh, you get it, uh, it doesn't exist. So, the artificial intelligence that doesn't exist is the one that. Uh, People are talking about in the media, you know, that, I mean, essentially, this is the Hollywood artificial intelligence that doesn't exist. The one that, um, uh, you know, is Terminator, the movie, you know, that is scary. Uh, or uh, Her, that might be, you know, something that you want, but I mean, I don't recommend to fall, fall in love, you know, with. Uh, with an artificial intelligence, it won't go anywhere, uh, but you can try. Uh, anyway, so this is this artificial intelligence that doesn't exist. I mean, obviously, you heard, you, you heard about artificial intelligence recently, you know, in the past year. We are talking a lot, a lot about it. Um, and um, those artificial intelligences do exist. Okay, so this is what I'm going to try to tell you tonight. 
is that there are many, 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 many artificial intelligences and there is not one. And uh, I try to give you some definitions you know, along the way uh, as well, so we can uh, be all on the same page. Artificial intelligence is actually not new. I mean, uh, for the people who think that, it only, that it's only you know, one year old, uh, this is wrong. Okay, so I mean, we are talking about artificial intelligence for the past 67 years, officially. This is when, in 1956, a bunch of scientists in uh, the University of Dartmouth you know, met and decided to use this term, artificial intelligence, um, to describe what they were doing at the time. And what they were doing was uh, trying to uh, model the, a, a neuron, you know, so mathematically. So when they said, a little bit too quick, uh, they said um, that if they have a neuron, they can have a neural network. If they have a neural network, they can have a brain. And if they can model the brain, they can model intelligence. So it was stupid, but we're going to go back to that. Um, and it was wrong. But anyway, so they called this thing artificial intelligence, and I think that it, it did create a lot of false ideas about what those you know, artificial intelligences can do. It gave them a little bit too much of the human side, and uh, that's why you know, in science fiction we created stuff like uh, the, the Terminator and other movies. So I'm going to tell you tonight that artificial intelligence has nothing, you know, has nothing to do with intelligence. So that's the part that is sad, but that's true. So anyway, so those guys in, uh, in 1956, they were trying to do something that actually humanity is trying to do for a long, long time. So it didn't start in 1956, it started in a way, way before that. For a long time, uh, people, humans, are trying to create machines that look intelligent, right? That are looking to do something that looks intelligent. And, uh, and so we can go way, way back in history, but since I'm French, you know, I'm going to go back only to uh, 1642. And 1642, this is when Pascal invented the Pascaline. The Pascaline was the very first you know, uh, calculator, basically, that was doing only additions and subtractions, but for digits, additions and subtractions. So, you know, you can say, okay, that's not that intelligent, you know, to do uh, uh, addition and subtraction, but if I'm asking how much is 1855 plus 1742? Waiting. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's a little bit intelligent, I don't know. So, I mean, uh, the reality is that you didn't get it. The machine would have done that in about three seconds, you know, just turning some wheels, and it would have been right. Even if you had given me you know, an answer, there was 60% of chances that you would have been wrong. But that's, uh, that's saying a lot about us. We are a lot wrong, okay? But uh, it's part of humanity, actually. But anyway, so all that to say that those kind of machines, those kind of systems, we are trying to do them, you know, to create them for a long, long time. So we didn't wait until 1956, uh, sorry, 1956, yes, to, to start, you know, those machines. So we are doing that for a long time. But I'm going to come back to those guys in 1956. The issue is that not only, you know, the I think uh, call this thing the wrong way, artificial intelligence, but also they try to solve something that is very, very complicated. They try to solve natural language. What is natural language? This is what we are doing right now, right? There is a guy talking, you are catching the words, but you are going to try to catch the meaning. And this is very, very complicated, you know? Even today, I'm not sure that we know how to do it. I mean, Siri doesn't know how to do it. Alexa, eh, no. I mean, nobody knows. I mean, basically, it's very complicated. So, in 1956, it was even more complicated, you know, and of course, guess what? They failed. Okay, they failed. And uh, we enter what we call the very first uh, winter of AI. What is the winter of AI? And basically, we stopped to work on that. We stopped to fund them. We stopped to give money because they lied to us. 
they promised something that didn't exist, that was impossible. And uh, this is very much what could happen again if we continue to lie about artificial intelligence, if we continue to lie about what it is and what it is not, if you continue to do so to Elon Musk. Okay. <laughs> it was easy. Uh, so, the, the, the reality is that, you know, it's difficult. I mean, the, we are trying to tackle those you know, things that are difficult, but we should just try to do the small things first. But anyway, so they failed, artificial intelligence died, but only for a few years, because uh, rapidly in the early 60s, another kind of artificial intelligence came back. And uh, I mean, first of all, we need to understand that artificial intelligence is just mathematics, right? So the one that they were trying to do in 56 was statistics, basically. It's going to come back, but statistics you know, didn't work at the time. And, uh, and uh, another kind came back and came, it was logic, you know, and the, the oldest guy in the room here understood, you know, I may remember what we had at the time, it was called export systems. But export systems came, it was pretty nice actually, it was only rules, it was logic, right? If blah blah blah, then blah blah blah, and you could build some systems that were pretty efficient, pretty good, you know, but I mean, if you had to work, on the, those decision trees, basically, it was kind of, you know, for a nice big system, it was very complicated and very complicated to fix and very complicated to maintain, but it was working pretty well. Actually, it was working so well that, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we had a lot of systems that were expert systems that were working pretty well. And then, in the, I mean, at the end of, uh, in the middle of the 90s, end of the 90s, there were something. There was something that was actually the best expert system you know we ever had. It was called Deep Blue by IBM. That did beat Kasparov at chess, right? Pretty impressive, pretty intelligent, right? It's very intelligent to play chess, right? Yeah, you need to be very, very smart. Actually, I don't know, but I mean the fact is that. Uh, it was working pretty well, and it did beat the world champion, so, so it was a nice system. But at the time, I mean, in the mid-90s, uh, it was pretty easy to have a lot of compute and some memory to put not all the, the, the moves that you have at chess, but a lot of them. And it was pretty easy, actually, to with a set of rules, because, you know, rules, database of rules, uh, is pretty much what you have in the game as well. I mean, it was pretty simple to have something that goes from any move, any position, to the winning uh, position. So, Kasparov was very good, he was very smart, but he had only maybe you know, 10 moves in his head. I mean, the machine had all of them. So, it's, it's a lot of moves. I mean, by the way, chess is about 10 of the power of 49 moves. Right? So, it's a lot of moves. Uh, so, anyway. Um, so, it was good. Uh, and the system were working fine, and uh, in the mid 90s, something else, uh, something else happened. And uh, what happened is, you know, the statistical AI came back. And why did the statistical AI came back? Is because of uh, a lot of data, you know, were available. So what happened? I mean, first of all, we changed the name. We called it, you know, machine learning. So, you know, but. The lot of data was coming from the internet, right? The internet arrived in the 95, 94, 95. And it came with a lot, a lot of data, right? The big data. It was, uh, well, it was, uh, what was the internet, you know? And uh, so we had machine learning and then we had deep learning. You know, it's even more data, you know, and more and more data. And now, you know, today, uh, generative AI, it's even more data. We come back to that. So a lot of data, but it allowed us to do statistics, of course, you know. And one of the first systems that was uh, new created was a recognizer of cats. <coughs> because it's very smart to recognize cats, right? And the, the reality is that there were a lot of cats on the internet because people were posting cats. You know, they are still doing it. So uh, we, we had a lot, a lot of cats. and. Uh, the nice thing is that it was an annotated database of cats because people were posting cats 
and saying, oh, this is my kitty, this is my little cat, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And so we have cats and cats and cats everywhere. And so the scientists you know, decided to do a recognizer of cats with only 100,000 cats who were able to recognize cats 98% of the time. That's smart. Right? But, you know, it was interesting. Ah, it's supposed to be uh, 100,000 by right here, but it didn't come up. But that's fine. Uh, so, anyway, very smart. Very good system, you know, 100,000 images of cats, you can make cats at 98%. And then you ask yourself, but us humans, how many cats we need to recognize cats? It's a good question. No? I didn't have the answer, but uh, at the time, you know, I asked a uh, psychologist, and they told me that my two year old, my two year old daughter, she needs two cats to recognize cats 100% of the time. 100% of the time. So the systems that we are doing with 100,000 cats, they are pretty dumb, right? Oh, my daughter is very smart. Um, okay. um, I won't comment more on that. Anyway, so, and, and why does, it, does she recognize cats 100% of the time, and why the system is recognizing only 98? It's because she recognizes cats even when it's dark, you know? She can recognize cats. The system cannot, you know why? Because nobody posted an image of the cat at night. <laughs> because you don't see it. <laughs> and so the thing is that if you have something that is not in the database, it doesn't exist. That's an issue. I will come back to that. Anyway, so we had a doubt already on those machines, and we said, okay, maybe they are not that smart, right? And they use a lot, a lot of data. It's going to be one of our issues. But now we are going to jump ahead a little bit, and we are going to go in uh, 2016. 2016, this is this time the world champion of Go, who is beaten by the machine, right? I mean, Go is much more complicated than, uh, than chess, right? I mean, uh, this is not a, a finished game. I mean, we can talk about that. But anyway, uh, if you ask mathematicians how many moves you have at Go, they are going to tell you that it's much more than the 10 or the power of 49 that we're not talking about, you know, for chess. But see, they are going to tell you it's between 10 of the power of 200 and 10 of the power of 600. So it means that they have no idea. Okay? It means also that it's a lot. You know, 10 of the power of 200 is much more than two of the power, uh, 10 of the power of uh, 49, right? It's not like somebody told me recently it's only four times more. I want to be sure who is in the room. So. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it's a lot. It's a lot, so we're not going to use those rules that we were using you know, back in 97. Uh, we're going to use now, you know, deep learning. So we are going to feed the machine with a lot of uh, games of Go. And, you know, it's going to uh, learn by itself, you know, how to play. And it's going to play really well because it's going to beat the world champion of Go. And this little 18 year old, you know, he said that you know, never a machine will kill me, you know, and he was killed. So, good stuff. Anyway, so I'm not going to explain the program itself, but I want actually to try to uh, look at the machine itself and look what is inside the machine. Inside this machine, there are 1500 CPUs, you know, the chips that we are putting in computers. 1500 CPUs. There are 300 GPUs, you know, GPUs, we are talking a lot about GPUs right now because they are, you know, hard to do the uh, generative uh, AI. But, so, 300 GPUs, and there is another type of, you know, little bugs there, that are uh, the TPUs, 30 TPUs. At the time, it was a new tensor processing unit. It's, done, uh, it's good for tensor flow, which is a, a deep learning method. I'm not going to do that, but basically this thing here, is 2,000 chips, 2,000 CPUs, 2,000, you know, computers. 2,000 computers to play Go. 2,000. Uh, by the way, this is the drawing. This is not the real machine, right? <laughs> Just. So, 2,000 machines is a small data center. A small data center to play Go. Right? 
So what is going to be my, my expression? What is the power that you need to power this machine? It's about 440 kilowatts. 440 kilowatts to play go. And the question is going to be, the little Korean guy, you know, 18 year old, what does he have? Let's see what he has. And so do you know how much that is in terms of what? For some of us? <laughs> exactly, 20 watts. So, I mean, we have a machine now that we built that is 440 kilowatts against the guy that is 20 watts, you know? And we are proud of it. 20,000 times this thing is taking, you know? I mean, this is ridiculous. And in addition to that, this little Korean guy, not only you will place Go, but he does also natural language, you know? He does also his cooking. He's doing a lot of stuff with these 20 watts. This machine with 440 kilowatts, it does only Go. If you wanted to play you know, chess, forget it. You have to redo everything. So again, those machines, they are not very smart. They are taking a lot of data. They are taking a lot of power. We need to be careful, specifically, you know, right now. Anyway, I talked a lot about data. You know, I mean, saying it's taking a lot of data, 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 data. So data is good. I mean, we have, uh, it's a good idea to put a lot of data, you know. I mean, when I'm going to put 100,000 cats, you know, in the database, I pretty much know that it's cats, you know, but there might be some dogs, you know, in the database. What I'm saying here, you know, the bigger the database is going to be, the more chances it's going to be biased. Data is biased. So, when we're talking about ChatGPT, for instance, the latest one, ChatGPT 4.0, it's taking not 100,000 pieces of data, not millions of data, Actually, it's taking about 2,000 billions of pieces of data. I mean, of course, we didn't verify everything, so this is totally biased. And there are a lot of, history, a lot of stories you know, about, uh, about those AIs that are doing wrong things because the database is wrong. You know? Of course, ChatGPT is one of them, but I will come back to that. But, um, one, one interesting one was in 2016 as well. It was very interesting you know, to, uh, to see that there was a system that was already a chat, a chat bot that was called Thai, that was already done by Microsoft at the time. And Thai, they developed it, they put it on Twitter. After 16 hours of operation, they had to unplug it because it became the most racist and sexist you know, but in the world. Of course they didn't want that. Of course they didn't want to, to, to create or to, you know, have a system that is going to be racist and sexist. So why did that happen? It didn't make any sense. But then, you know, you try to understand what happened. And when you create a system like a chatbot, you need a lot of dialogues, right? Because this is what it is about, dialogues. And dialogue, it's much more difficult to find on the internet than images of cats, right? So it happens that there is a database that exists that is called Switchboard, that is a database of conversations. This database is very old. You know, it started in the 50s in the States. This is a database that has millions of conversations that were taken over the phones from people you know, that are calling the, the call centers you know, to complain about their, their washing machine, uh, to, to say it doesn't work, you know, or to... So anyway, there are millions of conversations that are available in Switchboard, and they are all annotated, and they are all transcribed. So it means that you know exactly what people said, and you know if they were upset, if they were happy, blah, blah, blah. Very nice database that we have, you know, for the people who are doing systems that are going to be dialogue systems, it's heaven, right? So, that it. so now, imagine the, the system, the way it was built, right? You have this the guy at Microsoft that is told, you know, okay, uh, you have to build this system that is going to be tied, you know, it's going to be on Twitter, and uh, just, you know, uh, create this thing. Okay, 
And by the way, you have switchboard that you can use. It has million of conversation. Use that you know, to create the model. OK. So the guy said, OK, I don't need millions of conversations. I need only a subset. So OK, I'm going to take the beginning of the database. This is 50s Alabama. I'm happy that some people are you know, laughing because last time I did this one you know, in, a, in a high school, when I said 50s Alabama, <laughs> so yeah, I mean 50 Alabama, maybe you know, the, the black people were not really you know, considered the right way, right? Maybe there was some kind of uh, you know, intrinsic, intrinsic uh, racism in this thing. And this is exactly what happens in the database. The database is racist because the dialogue were racist. And so it didn't take long, 16 hours, for the thing you know, to become totally racist. And sexist because you can, you know, so why not? <laughs> anyway, so we need to be very careful because, of course, all the data, again, those database, they are biased. In any case, they are biased. You know? We have plenty, plenty of examples, you know, credit card systems, that are giving more money to men you know, than women. Because historically, this is the truth. But today, this is not. So I mean, there are a lot, a lot of, uh, of systems, a lot of issues. And with ChatGPT, you heard, of course, you know, a lot of different things that happen that are telling you that you know, the system is telling you some things that are not true. Because it's doing really kind of an average of what is on the internet. Because the thing when you have ChatGPT, ChatGPT is all the internet, basically, right? I mean, with the th thousands uh, of billions of data. And so you know that on the internet, everything is not true. You know that, right? <laughs> you know that, right? No, no, you, you know that it's not true. Okay. We need to talk. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, so of course, you know, sometimes it does answer some things that are totally wrong because it's doing an average and some picking you some of the, of the possible answers and it gives that back to you. There is a, <coughs> actually a study done by the Hong Kong University that says that ChatGPT is about 64% right. So it means that it's 36% wrong. <laughs> okay, so we need to remember that. Anyway, so data is bad, and it can create you know, all those chatbots that are going to be insulting and not very nice. So we need to be very careful. <coughs> so talking about uh, data, it's nice, but there is another part that is uh, an issue is the the fact that we always say that you know, it's complicated and uh, AI is a black box. Right? AI is a black box. We cannot explain it, so we shouldn't maybe you know, trust it, and uh, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to, to tell you something else today that is counterintuitive. <laughs> but AI is actually not a black box. Everything is explainable. Explicability is something you know, complicated, and a lot of people are saying that uh, explicability is is not possible for those kind of systems because it's too complex, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just going to, to say that everything is explainable if we take the time to do it. So of course, you know, here when we have 100,000 uh, pieces of data, it's pretty simple to go over them, you know, and we find the dogs in the middle of the cats, or we can remove them so it's easy to explain. But uh, when you have you know, billions of data, it's more complicated. But it's not only about the data, it's also about the algorithm and stuff. But what I'm claiming is that the people who are creating the AIs, they know which is the, the trend and where it's going to be. And for them, it's not a black box. They can explain where and how they are doing the stuff. And it's not new. I mean, when you're looking at history of science, every time there is something new, it's kind of a black box. Every time you know you have something that is something that is complicated, it's a black box. Until we learn about it, until we understand it. And I have an example for that. That is a <coughs> personal example. Uh, it's the story of a French mathematician uh, that was called uh, Gaston Julia. Gaston Julia was a good guy. You know, in 1914, he discovered an equation that was called the factors. He called that the factors. So people who know in the room what the factors are, you have something in your head now because you know what the factors are. Um, people who don't know what the factors are, uh, go to Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> so anyway, 
Gaston, you know, back in 1914, he has this equation, you know, that is just exciting. Exciting for mathematicians, right? So he's excited, he writes a paper, mathematicians are excited, but real people, people in the street, I mean, when they look at the equation, they're not excited. <laughs> it's an equation, you know, it's complicated. It's a black box. 1955, 40 years later, Gaston is a professor at Polytechnic, you know, one good group in France, and uh, he has a, a student who is called uh, Mandelbrot. You know, and Mandelbrot is a good listener. He leaves for the States, he goes to IBM, and he's given one of the first computers. And Mandelbrot enters you know, the Julia equation in the computer and plots it, right? Oh, and he calls it also Mandelbrot equation, no, why not? Hmm? <coughs> That's fine, we talk about that. Uh, anyway, so he enters the equation and then appears on the screen this beautiful drawing that the people who knew what the fractal is, you know, is the fractal. And what is the fractal? This is something that is showing the property of recursivity. At any level of the drawing, you have the next level of the drawing that is the same one. And this beautiful drawing is showing you it's just a, a very simple uh, I mean, way to everybody what is the property of a fractal. Right? 40 years later, it was possible for everybody to see that this black box became transparent. Really exciting. For those who still don't know what it is, I mean, uh, think about the La Finca, the cheese. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so anyway, I'm not saying that in 40 years we'll have you know, all the explicability for all the AIs, but I'm saying that if we want to, we can. Okay, so I was a little bit pissed about this story between Julia and Mandelbrot, right? So, but, and I'm even more pissed with autonomous driving. In this country, you are, you know, claiming that Tesla was a good guy, right? Okay, good. And you have now a brand that is called, you know, uh, and there is a guy, Elon Musk, did I mention Elon Musk already? <laughs> so, Elon Musk is claiming since 2014 that autonomous driving is for tomorrow. The issue is that tomorrow passed, you know, something like 10 years already, right? So anyway, so I have, Good news or bad news, it depends if you like to drive. But uh, autonomous driving level five, which is the, you know, the full autonomy, <coughs> will never exist. Never. I mean, it's not like tomorrow or 2040, 50, 60. Never. Like never. <laughs> yeah. So uh, pretty simple. Um, you can dream about it if you want. You can, you know, have some uh, very nice science fiction movies, whatever you want. Autonomous driving, driving level five will never exist. Autonomous driving level four will exist. That I come back to that. But where are we today? Where is Tesla today? Level two. Okay, we are still very, very, very far to, you know, to, to achieve level four, but we will. I'm sure that we will uh, achieve level 4 because level 4 is going to be mostly autonomous, it's going to be very safe, we're going to save a lot, a lot of lives you know, on, the, on the street, and it's going to happen, but I don't know exactly when because I'm not Elon Musk, so I'm not going to tell you when. Okay? But it's going to happen most likely. Level 3 is about to happen, right? So it's, it's pretty good. So, but let me explain why level 5 will never exist, and let me give you two examples actually. The first example is for the people who have been in France. It's for the people who, you know, know France pretty well, know Paris pretty well, and know something that is called Place de l'Etoile at 6 p.m. <laughs> Place de l'Etoile is this, you know, big uh, roundabout with a lot of avenues coming, and it's a big mess. At 6 p.m., it's just impossible, you know, to, to drive this thing unless you have some special skills. And those AIs, those autonomous driving cars, you know, they cannot have those special skills because they do one thing that you shouldn't do on the Place de l'Etoile at 6 p.m. 
they follow the rules of driving. <laughs> okay, so if you do that, you are going to be stuck for about three hours. The other guys will go, you will never go. You need to have some other skills, you know, that are social skills. Negotiation skills, you know, <laughs> or negotiation skills. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, forget that. Uh, so those cars, they cannot, you know, handle that. But I'm going to give you another example that is, you know, the international example. It's an example that, that is actually coming from um, a database that is done by Wemo. Wemo is the company from Google, you know, that is working on autonomous cars for 10 years. And they are certainly the best in the world today, you know, to, to know about uh, autonomous driving. And, um, and the CEO of Wemo in 2018, after four years of Elon, you know, saying bullshit, he said, okay, stop. I'm going to say that autonomous driving level 5 will never exist, and autonomous level 4 will exist, and because of that, I'm going to give all the data that I have. And this guy gave 10 millions of miles of driving in video, you know, to the community that was working on autonomous driving. And of course, people like myself, you know, we jumped on the, the video because he put that on YouTube, and we went to look for what I'm calling a gem, and what is a gem for me is something that says that I'm right. And what is the first gem that I found? I didn't have time to look at the 10 million miles. It's a lot of miles. And even, you know, if you go uh, speed 2 on YouTube, it's still very slow. Anyway, so um, there is a video, one of them, the first one I found actually, uh, but an hour after you were looking at the thing, right? So pretty fast. I found a video of a car that is driving in the street of Mountain View. Mountain View is the place where you have the headquarters of the Google, right? And Mountain View is boring as hell. I mean, it's, there is nothing happening there. And so the car is riding along the street. And after a while, you see the car stops. And then, you know, you have two, three seconds, the car goes two, three meters, you know, and stops. Two, three meters, it stops. Two, three meters, stops. It does that six times, seven times, and then you see, because the camera is just on the top of the windshield, you see that the, the, the safety driver, there's always a safety driver, takes the wheel, you know, the steering wheel, and drives away, because the guy is you know, behind him. <coughs> and what kind of nervous, you know, why is this fucking guy, you know, uh, stopping in the middle for nothing, right? It doesn't make any sense. And then you look at the video, because it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. So you look at the video and you see on the video that there are two guys walking on the sidewalk. So two guys are walking on the sidewalk in the same direction of the car. Right? Same direction, two guys are walking there. And you look really closely at the video and you see that the guy that is the closest to the road on his shoulder I did also that before, it doesn't make any sense, but okay, let's go. What does the very smart car do? This is a stop sign, and a stop sign, and a stop sign. Okay, so there is an issue with those AIs, you know, and, and I mean, there is something that we did well actually in the past year, talking about generative AIs, we talked about those AIs by naming them correctly. Because we call them generative AIs. We even call them creative AIs. Because they do not create anything. The car there that, so, that sees something on you, it sees something new, but it doesn't get it. Because it cannot create any new situation. As humans, we invent, we create, we do stuff you know, that is Sometimes we are, but we adapt to situations that we never saw before. 
those AIs, they cannot do that. They rely on the history. They rely on the models. I mean, by definition, models, you know, that have data, they have data that is history because there is no data from the past. I mean, I don't have any. If anybody has one, you have to tell me. But anyway, so we have to realize that those AIs, they do not create anything. They do not create any new situation, understand new situation. OK, so that's done. No autonomous driving level 5. I'm going to spend, I don't spend any time on Siri, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it's all now, it was done in 1997, uh, and uh, it came to your pockets in 2014, so, uh, yeah, so it means that it, we waited 14 years, which was a long time, but it was pretty interesting because we created Siri actually with one thing in mind, is that those machines are stupid. And so when we created Siri, we didn't create any artificial intelligence. We created a lot of artificial stupidity. So this is what it is about. Okay? We know that it doesn't work. And this is because we know it doesn't work that we have this little thing that the other guys didn't have because they thought that they were right and that they were doing something incredible. We knew that we were doing something that didn't work very well. So that's why we added the little you know, jokes that Siri is doing and was doing you know, at the time. So it was the difference between us and the other one. But I want to spend enough time on that. I want to say that AI, I'm fed up with the artificial intelligence you know, name. And I call that actually augmented intelligence. Those tools, because there are, there are many, many tools. If I have to give one definition to AI, I'm going to say that it's a toolbox. It's a toolbox in which you know, I have a lot, a lot of tools. And a lot of deep, diverse tools, right? And, and so it's like a toolbox where you are going to have a hammer, like a screwdriver, a saw. They are all very different. If you try you know, to drive a nail with a saw, you are going to spend some time, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And those tools, they are all very powerful, different and powerful, but very specific to whatever you know, they are meant for, OK? So when they are going to be better than you, this is the definition of the tool for this very task that they are you know, meant for, OK? So this is why those tools are going to help us very much like the Pascaline was helping us to do uh, the, the addition and subtractions they are going to help us to be better at something very, very specific. So they augment our intelligence. And I'm going to finish you know, very quick by giving you something that you will remember all your life. OK. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> this is a bold claim, but look. I'm going in front of your eyes to define intelligence mathematically, because this is the only thing I can do. So, I mean, intelligence, you know, I actually I have no idea what it is, but I'm going to claim that I can project it on this, you know, graph here. I'm going to say that I can project intelligence on this thing. It's going to go from zero, Donald Trump, to 100. Okay? 100 is a genius, not Donald Trump. And then it's going to be here all the different intelligences, the different domains, whatever you want, right? And the very first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to project the human intelligence. This is us. We are not geniuses. Some things we are better than others. But it's pretty cool, right? We can uh, say something about anything, especially us French. <laughs> And I'm going to claim that it's continuous across all the domains. And I'm going to claim actually that it's infinite. Because we can invent stuff. This is us. Really nice, huh? <clears throat> now let's project AIs. Chess. It's pretty good. Right? It's a genius. If you win against the machine, it's because you did set it to level two. <laughs> Where is Go? Uh, Go is interesting because you know it's not a finite game, as I said before, so it's complicated. So I'm going to claim that it's actually more than a genius. Right. Cool. Autonomous driving. Where is it? It's pretty good. Right. 
It's not ingenious because it will never go to. Thank you. I'm sure that you heard something tonight, shit. <laughs> okay, so it will never go to level five, but I mean, it's better than my son, that is right there. Right? <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> okay. So this one, I for, we will see what it means. Anything, any domain, we can be the tool that is going to be better than us if we want to on this very thing that we are going to be able to address, right? So I'm claiming that we can be the tool, if we really want to, that is going to be better than us in any sense. This is the eyes. <coughs> what is the difference between the curve that I did before, continuous infinite, and the one that I just drew with the eyes? Discretion, now it's in mathematics, right? So this is discrete curve. <coughs> So here, this is a philosophical, mathematical question. How many discrete points do you need to reach infinity or continuity? OK, the answer is a lot. <laughs> it's infinite. OK, infinity is complicated. Huh? It's a lot of stuff. Right? So it uh, means that if you want to have a system that is being as smart as us, humans, you need an infinity of those AIs. It's going to take a long time. So sometimes I'm told, yeah, yeah, but you know, there is something you can do when you have a domain, and you have a domain that is very close, you can actually learn from the domain, and then, you know, maybe by capillarity, you can have something that is going to be basically, you know, continuous. It's called transfer learning, right? It's a pretty good idea, right? I love transfer learning. But there is an issue, you know, and look at that. Uh, there is, the issue is right there. What do you have between two contiguous lines? No? Infinity. This infinity shit, you know, is a, it's complicated. <laughs> so uh, it comes all the, all the place all the time, I mean, that's... That's really bad because I mean you have always a case and actually an infinity of cases that are not in, you know, into the two things there. So so complicated. And there's another issue. It's right there. The thing that we are creating, right? So imagine that you just, just did create something. Super, and you are starting to tell people around you, it's great. <coughs> Where is the eye? nowhere until you decide to create the AI. So anyway, all that to say that I thank you very much and you can take questions. <laughs>
Is it just uh, some technology breakthrough, uh, some new processing power or something else, or it is just hype because now we have uh, a generative AI tools uh, available to anyone? Because uh, a few years ago, I think only it was a domain of some experts who are experts in AI, and now everybody can do AI. What do you think of that? Yeah, so I mean, I think that you're exactly right. I mean, the, the new hype is just about the accessibility. But then let me let me just explain a little bit more what that means. I mean, AI, as I said, it exists, you know, for the past AIs. They are existing, you know, for the past 67 years. And we have a lot of evolutions. I mean, we saw there were some winter of AIs, we saw that. And so we started with statistics, and then, you know, we had machine learning. Acceleration, really, in the past 20 years, right? 25 years, we had acceleration with those uh, machine learning, deep learning, and now generative AI. So, but, I mean, I think that it's just evolution, right? So it's evolution of technology, as you said, you know, because we have more uh, uh, power, I mean, power processing, processing power, sorry. We have more uh, you know, memory, we have more, more, more of the hardware also that is allowing us to do that. But when you look at ChatGPT, for instance, you know, we could claim that it's a revolution. You know, and that it's not only evolution. We could claim that because if there is a revolution actually in ChatGPT, this is not in the GPT part. GPT is the AI, right? This is the, uh, the generative the pre trained uh, transformer. No? This is what GPT means. This is the AI, right? More data, blah, blah, blah. So this is not there that is the revolution. The revolution is in the chat, right? The fact that now, as you just said, anybody can use this thing, right? By just being able to do like, you know, this little comment guy, by talking, by just being able to just say something in natural language. The fact that now, you know, this tool in the prompt, what is called the prompt, you know, in those generative AIs, you can enter anything. You can enter your text, you can enter, enter images, you can enter music, you can enter, you know, something that you understand that is going to be, you know, ingested in the machine and then going to generate. So there is, this is not a revolution, actually, for the AI. This is an evolution, but this is a revolution for the usage. And that's true that it's very, very impressive because everybody can use it. But at the same time, it means that it's very dangerous because everybody can use it. Yes, as you said, it's not the technology, it's the people who we should be afraid of. Exactly. Of Okay, so since we are here... Yes, sorry, uh, yes. uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Not only. Also, <laughs> one of them. Okay, so uh, here we are uh, at Alumni, at the uh, Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing. And I say it is not the general population here uh, who are facing these uh, engineers, some of the people. Uh, the city don't do the, the, the addition that I asked them to do. <laughs> <laughs> We will come to that. <laughs> hey. Okay, uh, but uh, I, I like uh, what you what, what you show uh, with uh, with this machine playing go because uh, today AI is uh, kind of say uh, let's say uh, quite um, inefficient in terms of power usage or in terms of uh, you know you need two thousand three thousand processors to to, to match uh, some some of this human. However, uh, okay, we uh, can say we, uh, we are witnessing some kind of revolution, at least uh, in minds uh, how available uh, tools are. But still, we as engineers cannot be impressed with this side, how inefficient it is. However, uh, there is a new technology called neurobotic computing, and uh, it has lots of promises. For example, this technology, maybe not everybody here is uh, familiar with that, it is something that we try in chip on a silicon to emulate much more in hardware how brain works, how these uh, formulas work, so not to emulate it only on software of some very, very fast processor. So what's the state of the art of neuromorphic computing and uh, does it going to make a really uh, big change in terms of power efficiency, in terms of computation power? Yeah. No, so as I don't know. Okay, so I don't know. I mean, of course, this is very interesting. There is one issue that I have with uh, neuromorphic computers I and mean, chips is that it trying, as you said, to emulate the brain. And the main issue that I have is that we, we collectively, uh, and the scientists who are uh, um, studying the brains today, we still don't know what it is, right? 
And, and the issue is that when you ask them what is the brain and how does it work, I mean, according to the people that you are talking to, they are going to, to tell you that we know between 20 and 40 percent of the, the brain. So if you are trying to emulate the brain knowing only you know, 30 percent of it, uh, this is an issue. So I say that it's a very good idea to try to create um, systems that are going to be um, much more efficient in terms of power, because we saw that it's definitely you know, not good for that. So it's, it's good to continue the, the research on that, and it's good to try to do something. You know, I, I mean, it's the case also uh, uh, with uh, all the quantum computing. It's pretty much the same thing. It's very good to try to do something that's going to be different in order to find new ways to do things. But I think we are pretty far. So, uh, because I saw a presentation when I was in Brussels at some conference uh, three years ago or something like that, it was uh, the case of autonomous drivers. It was a neuromorphic chip, you know, you have a camera, you have some computer game, etc., etc. It looked really promising, and the point was to uh, reduce the power consumption. So, as I say, uh, as I see, no uh, huge movement was uh, done in this technology in the last couple of years. So it is still yeah, complicated. I mean, uh, that's complicated, but again, it doesn't prevent us to, to try to, uh, to go towards a place that we think is the right one. But again, I mean, today we cannot claim that we can do a, 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 a chip that is going to be, you know, emulating the brain. We cannot claim that. Of course. Still far, far away from that. Okay, so uh, everybody talks about big data, how to gather data, how to make uh, much more computational power, uh, this uh, huge type, hype uh, with uh, large language models. However, it is, there is much less hype about something that is maybe even more interesting, and it is called HBI. Because uh, HBI is something how to have uh, models that will uh, be deployed uh, where they are needed, just in time, with low latency, and it brings us on the other side of the spectrum. Because now uh, we have large models sitting in the cloud behind the walls of enterprise, etc., etc. But how much work is done to transform these models into, for example, some embedded systems? Very, uh, very limited uh, resources to have them uh, sitting in our cars, barrels, houses, etc. Yeah, I mean, this is a trend that we need to explore more because, I mean, for sure, big data, huge data, I and mean, when you see you know, thousands of, uh, of billions of data in order to create the model for ChatGPT, it's not sustainable. And in addition to that, the generative AIs that we are talking about, the ones you know, that are upstairs that are in the cloud, I mean, those guys, they not only take power, you know, to, a lot of power to create the models, but it does also take power, it does take power um, at the inference level, so at the time of, you know, uh, the, the answer of the question. So, <clears throat> it's not sustainable. If you had today, if you had today, you know, as many questions to chat GPT that you have for um, a Google, there is not enough power in the world right now. To, to, to make that happen, right? So that's that. So to answer the question about the edge AI, I mean, this is definitely something that is interesting. I mean, we, we are t talking about the, the, the domain, you know, the, the people who are working in AI, of AI. We are trying to do something that is more, you know, decentralized. Because, I mean, centralization, obviously, you know, is not sustainable, and centralization you know, takes a lot of power from the data center, blah, blah, blah. So trying to explode, you know, those things, and to do more at the edge, so wherever the data is, you know, to have to transfer the data, wherever, you know, the power, less power is needed because less data is available, this is something that is called, for instance, federated learning, you know, is something very interesting because you have to try to federate all the pieces that are outside, that are on the edge, you know, to do some kind of what you would do if it were, uh, uh, you know, centralized, but you are trying to do that, you know, decentralized. So this is something interesting. Obviously, you know, the statistics are working more when you have more data. I mean, you have a limit. I mean, sometimes, you know, it doesn't, you don't need to have you know, that, that much data. But, but I mean, statistics, by definition, is better if you have a bunch. So when you have on the edge not a lot of data, it's complicated, right? So, but for very specific things that you are doing, you could very much imagine that you are creating some you know, basic models centralized 
that now are going to learn more on the, on the edge. And this is what would happen, for instance, in cars and stuff. You do some basic models, you then deploy the, those basic models that are going to learn on very specific data because, you know, maybe cars that are running in Finland, you know, they are not going to have the same behavior that the cars are running in Croatia. So, you know, maybe they can learn some very specific things there and then, you know, work themselves on, on, the, on the very specific areas or data that are there. I think it, it is really important uh, in, in terms of practical applicability because you don't want to have very good AI uh, depending on some API, for example, if you're in a car. No matter 5G and uh, low latency, if there is no connection, you don't want to crash at all because uh, there is no internet connection. Yeah. So I think that is that uh, to, to push uh, much, much more. So can we say that maybe today's embedded systems are a little, little bit Leading behind the AI in terms of how fast AI is developing. I mean, for sure, I mean, the race is more on the big models, right? I mean, the large language models, uh, definitely the race is there, and people you know, are all trying to create their own models, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the reality is that uh, in cars, for instance, I mean, as you just said, we need to have you know, some AI that is going to be very specifically done you know, downstairs and that is not going to, to need the connectivity because the uh, AI is not going to work. And, and we know that latency is also you know, a problem when you don't have 5G or whatever. So this is l where people are putting less money, let's say, but this is something that is still very, very important. And by the way, the regulation is going to push you know, for some AIs to be in the cars, very much like you have you know, the, the safety belts you know, in the 70s, we are going to have to have you know, some AIs, some safety AIs, uh, embedded in the, in the local uh, systems. Yes, I, I think uh, even now we have some, uh, some, some very fascinating examples. For example, with one of my students, I was uh, doing the research, can we, for example, make some wearable device to uh, monitor voice in real time, for example, to have some stuttering problems in uh, speech, etc. And of course, you have some privacy concerns if you want to, uh, uh, to, to record uh, everything, um, you know, SD card or something like that for uh, being analyzed in cloud or something. Uh, what we done is we took some existing machine learning model and we uh, downloaded it uh, for some research uh, based on data from patients, etc. etc. And we used Tensor for Light to put it on a microcontroller. It was not even the microcontroller with some uh, extent. What shocked us was that it was able to do the processing of this model in just 2% of usage of processors. So it was, wow, uh, how, uh, it is, I think it is underestimated what can we now do. But when we say, uh, and I uh, mentioned Tensor for Light, okay, it is some kind of uh, closed framework. We have other trainers, etc. However, I would uh, say that there is a lot of uh, race and struggle uh, in some terms, uh, between open source community and commercial uh, companies. So, what is your uh, opinion about that? Uh, do uh, open, so the open source community can stand a chance against uh, commercial competitors? I think we have similar dilemma like Windows versus Linux or something like that. Now, I would say, for example, ChatGPT and OpenAI have like quite a good model. They cannot be yet uh, challenged by some in the open source community. For example, there are lots of models on the hardware face uh, page. But do you think uh, in the future uh, open source community will prevail or other way around? So I'm not going to make predictions because I'm not even most. But uh, <coughs> the, the, the reality is that it's. Uh, it's going to come most likely in the open source community because we are going to have to have something that is not American based, let's say, right? So we see, for instance, today on Looking Face, you know, a lot of those models that are coming that are more, you know, and we have some European ones that are coming with Mistral, you know, and, uh, and some others, uh, the Bloom, that are, you know, European uh, uh, models that are open source and that are using data that are more diverse than the data that is used you know, by, uh, <coughs> and less skewed, let's say, you know, towards uh, the states than the one from the commercial guys. The commercial guys today you know, are really 
de, de, de Gamma, par exemple, de GAFAM, si vous en trouvez le mais c'est aussi really Google, uh, Microsoft uh, and, uh, and Facebook qui ont des modèles big models today that are commercial. I mean, Facebook is not commercial, or maybe it is a little bit, I don't know. So, so anyway, so uh, the reality is that we, we need to have more frugal models. And uh, the big guys, they don't need that, maybe, but I mean, they're realizing now that they, actually they spend a lot of power, a lot of electricity, you know, for the, the, the running of their models. So that's why Microsoft is announcing that they are going to uh, put some uh, nuclear plants next to their, uh, to, to their uh, data centers, which is incredible. Um, <coughs> but, um, but the thing is that it costs a lot of energy, so maybe they will have to shrink also the models at one point. But they don't really need it because they are the big guys who have big money. Um, if you want to use, and for instance, I mean, to take the case you know of what we are doing, if you want to use some generative AI uh, in your company, you are not going to create a huge model like that because you don't have the millions and billions of dollars actually that you need to do that. And so we can use some open source uh, models more and more now that are maybe <coughs> only 7 billions or 34 billions you know, models that are going to be fine-tuned by your own data and that you can do you know, in-house on your own internet or something. So I, I think this is something that is going to happen more and more. Because first, today we might not trust uh, the way where the data is going upstairs you know, at OpenAI and something. It's funny, by the way, that it's called OpenAI and it's closed, but I keep closed. But it's, yeah, it's, it's just a name. It's just a, a loser story, it's incredible. But anyway, so, so you don't want to trust maybe, but remember, I mean, at the beginning we didn't trust the cloud either, right? And little by little they, they did put some uh, areas that made people believe that they could put, you know, their medical uh, information in the cloud. So, I don't know, the reality is that I think that we will see more and more smaller, uh, more um, <coughs> customizable uh, models that are going to be more, you know, coming from open source. Thank you. Yes, I, I wanted to suggest because may, my questions are maybe boring. <laughs> Since there are so many of us, maybe someone has a good question for our guest. So please. Anyone? Okay, promise. There's a nice uh, there. Thank you. It, it's always the first stroke that's asking the questions. So I'm curious, in Renault, for example, I'll go into that. How much of AI can you fit in a car, electric car, a small city car, having a relatively small battery, like in Renault Twingo, about 20 kilowatts, and I'm driving for an hour for 10 kilometers, so range is not an issue. So I wonder how much AI <coughs> And cons consumption of power can fit in that. How do you see that evolution right now? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, uh, if it takes a lot of power upstairs, it's going to take some power downstairs. And you're going to have a kind of a balance between what you're going to use for, the, for driving the car and for, you know, having some features there. The, the reality is that you are going to have some, as I say, some regularity, some regulatory uh, feature that you are going to have to implement yeah. anyway. So, when a car runs, it actually creates also electricity, right? So the some of the electricity that we can have on those very specific systems might be <coughs> frugal enough to be powered by the car itself and not, uh, not uh, I mean, killing the, the driving range. So the fact is that there will be more and more AIs in the cars for safety reasons. So, all that we call the ELAS, the, the, the driver aids basically. I mean, we are going to have more and more of that, and the regulator is going to ask for more and more of that. So, we have to do it, so we have to find a way. And the balance that will be between the range, the, the driving range, and, uh, and the, the power used by those AIs, we have to do it. There was a mic. Uh, hi, there are many questions really which came from the audience. 
uh, we will not be able to build water, but we will be sun. Uh, if, we, if we remove people from driving cars, only computers, is autonomous drive level 5 possible? Uh, okay, if we remove people from driving cars, only computers. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, <coughs> level five. Yeah, it's a good, uh, good uh, classic question. So, <clears throat> what you describe if we have only uh, level five cars in the street, it's called train. <laughs> there is also something that, is, uh, that we need to consider there is that unfortunately uh, the cats won't be level 5, the people uh, on bikes won't be level 5, the people on foot won't be level 5, so it would be a mess anyway, you know, so sorry. So nothing. Uh, there is actually a live question in the back here. <laughs> Why do I wear to watches? To be on time. <laughs> uh, then we have a question, is human intelligence declining? Are we building on existing knowledge or are we forgetting important bits in a human intelligence technology? This is referring to the last slide with approximate human intelligence curve. Yeah, we just hear the, the definition that I gave, you know, the mathematical definition is an approximation. Okay, that wasn't the real thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, our knowledge evolve, you know, obviously, and, uh, and so uh, things are going to change over time, uh, and we will have the definition of intelligences, because there are many of them, is going to uh, you know, evolve, and then, you know, the artificial intelligence is going maybe to, uh, to get closer on that. Uh, and what are your current challenges in Renault, uh, which you are trying to solve using AI? Yeah, so I'm not going to say much because I'm going to be told about my communication that I shouldn't say that. But, uh, <coughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of challenges, right, I and mean, we talked about uh, some of them that are going to be, I mean, you need to create those systems that are going to take the lives of people in your hands, right, I mean, you need to be sure that the systems are going to be more and more secure, so, so this is a very, very interesting challenge to do that. But, I mean, when you think about a company uh, like Renault, I mean, AI can be everywhere, you know, because it goes in the factories, obviously, you know, there are a lot of robots in, uh, already. We can add a lot of AI in the robots to know, you know, that you don't want to break the chain, you know, in the, in the factory. We know, thanks to AI now, we are able to know when a machine, when a robot is going to be uh, dead. It's going to die. It's called men uh, predictive maintenance, right? So we know in advance roughly when it's going to die. So you can actually repair it before it dies. And this is very, very interesting because it allows us to have, you know, the, the more productivity basically. So in the factories, it's interesting, there are a lot of AIs. In the support functions, now you know thanks to those generative AIs that are very affordable, you know, by anybody, you can have in the support functions a lot of AI. In HR, in human resource, in, um, <coughs> in purchasing, in, uh, I mean, any of those support functions, they can use some of the tools, you know, that are going to be fine-tuned with their very domain, and it's going to be uh, very, very good, actually. So, so AI is everywhere, and of course, AI is in the car, not only for safety, but also <coughs> to help. The, the, the new electric cars, they are very different from the old 100-year-old uh, cars that we are used to, you know, the, uh, the cars that you just, you know, put some gasoline in it, you know, and it runs. I mean, electric cars, they are going to run differently according to the temperature, according to a lot of different factors. We don't know that. So we can add some intelligence, some artificial intelligence in the car that is going to help you to manage this new kind of driving. Know when, when and where you should charge your car. You know, I mean, a lot of things. So, what we're building and what we're going to have, and it's only public, so I can say it, 
um, we're going to have in the, uh, in the next cars in 2024 is a little, uh, a little guy you know, that is going to be a little bit like the cricket on your shoulder, right? That is going to help you anytime in the car to tell you what you can do and what you can do you know, according to what is happening around you. So this is, this is what we call an avatar that is going to, uh, to react according to what you should know in this new car. So it's pretty interesting because it's pure artificial intelligence. It, if you will, it's like, uh, it's like Siri++, plus plus plus, right? So it's a Siri with an embodiment. So the little guy that you're going to relate to in the car and it's going to give you some advices or to give you some, some ideas of what to do next. Personal assistant in a car. Exactly. Great. And uh, how do you see AI evolving in the next decade? And what impact do you think it will have on the society? So, I mean, uh, again, I don't know, right? But I mean, I, I, I feel that it needs to evolve in at least two ways. It needs to be more flexible, as I said, in both data and uh, power. So, it needs to evolve there. The other thing that I think it needs to do is that we need uh, to understand, to, to remember what we did before. I mean, the issue is the past 20 years with, the, with machine learning, deep learning, and genetic AI, is that those AIs, they made us forget uh, the previous one, the expert systems. Expert systems were great for a lot of things. But now we can, because it's easy, those AIs today, they are easy, basically, you know, because doing statistics is easier than doing logic. I can talk about that. Anyway, so, so there are systems that we could do in logic that we don't do because it's too easy to do them in, uh, in statistics. So what I believe is that at one point we are going to have, you know, a merge, hybridation of, you know, the old thing, logical AI, with the statistical AI. And it would be very good also for frugality, I think. So, but this is complicated to merge you know, those, two, uh, those two kinds of mathematics. It's always you know, it has been an issue for the past two, three thousand years. Yeah. OK. Um, Thank you. Uh, when you answer these questions, I uh, uh, heard you mention robots, uh, because you use them, of course, in uh, industrial settings. So so to say you can use AI to help uh, production of devices, of uh, cars, etc, etc. But if we uh, get back to generative AI and uh, books that uh, we witnessed in the last uh, year, we can also talk about kind of industrial revolution, so to say. Because when we said, uh, watching history, what happened in each industrial revolution, some kind of technical uh, technical advancement made some uh, of the jobs obsolete. And uh, this is the same with generative AI. I know that many are feared, will they be replaced by AI? And this is uh, something that was always feared when we have some new technologies. Well. Uh, generative AI uh, now attacks, so to say, uh, jobs that uh, we thought that, that will never be attacked in such a way. For example, let's take uh, an example of programmers. Now, you have junior programmers uh, who are being slightly uh, replaced by tools like not just GPT, but you have GitHub Copilot or something like that. Well, I don't want to say that programmers will be replaced. As you said, there is no such thing as AI because AI is not created. Let's face it, junior programmers, for example, do not um, do most of their job, uh, which is creating one. So, such tools are very powerful in hands of uh, senior programmers. But how uh, everybody will, anybody will uh, become senior programmer if we do not need junior programmers anymore, for example. Yeah. And it is something that is happening in IT world. Um, what's with other professions? Okay, so we need to go back in history, but I don't want to be too long. But anyway, the reality is that jobs that disappear, that disappear you know, is very rare. Jobs do not disappear. I'm going to ask you actually to think about 12 jobs that did disappear in the past 2,000 years. You won't find them. I can't believe you won't find them. So there are a lot of tasks 
that might disappear, that might change inside jobs, but the jobs themselves are going to stay. There will be a lot less of some of the jobs that they don't disappear. That said, I mean, uh, uh, let's talk about programmers in particular. So junior programmers are going to continue uh, to, uh, to exist actually because they are going to use the tools. And they are going to become much, uh, I mean, much faster senior programmers. What we are seeing, you know, by the use of those tools, and we are seeing that, you know, in all the super functions, super functions that we were talking about before, we are seeing for the first time, I would say, that those tools, and this is why I call that augmented intelligence, they are actually leveling on the top, from the top. Instead of leveling you know, from the bottom, they are leveling from the top. And we see that the junior programmers or the junior whatever that are using the tools, they are gaining much more than the senior programmers that are using the tool. It means that the senior programmers are still you know, using the tool and they are gaining, but the gain gap is actually you know, much bigger for the junior guys. So it's going, you know, we are augmenting in a way, you know, much faster to the guys that are the lower levels. So that's very interesting to see that. So, um, so I, I believe that you know it's still interesting to have those guys. But there are some professions you know that are saying we are going to be replaced. Programmers, I don't think that they do because of the creativity that uh, that, that you talked about. But there is a profession that I love, you know, journalists. Uh, that, uh, that are saying all the time that they are going to be replaced. That's why they are writing all those papers, you know, about the fear of, uh, of the, the, the AI. And actually, you know, the journalists, every time I talk to one, I tell them AI, generative AI in particular, is an incredible opportunity for you, for your jobs, for your profession, to have actually more journalists. Because the reality is that those AIs that we're talking about, you know, I mean, mid-journey or even, you know, ChatGPT and so on, I mean, they are generating potentially, you know, a lot of deep fakes, you know, and uh, fake news and blah, blah, blah. And because of that, I mean, we are going to need more of the journalists, you know, to investigate and to do actually what they are supposed to do, you know, to do something that is complicated, something that is incredibly difficult, which is, you know, investigation. And this is the meat of your job. This is what you are supposed to do. And now you have, thanks to this generative AI, you have the opportunity to shine. You have the opportunity and by yourself. You won't do it. So it means that you, know, you need to know a bunch of journalists now to, to prove that this information is right and this one is wrong. So that's an opportunity, I think. And it's going to happen actually in a lot of jobs. And, and now you need to do a little bit of philosophy. And uh, we need to come back to, um, uh, to, to the, the beginning of the 20th century, you know, where we have a bunch of philosoph philosophers, you know, who told us, philosophers, uh, philosophers, philosophers uh, who, who told us uh, that uh, jobs are actually not being replaced, that they are being enhanced, they are, they are being enhanced by the technology. So, no fear for jobs, because still LLMs uh, are growing in 35 percent. Yeah. So we still need, uh, we yeah. still need them all. Yes. Yeah. So, one. Uh, this is amazing words. I believe it's a perfect moment to say a very warm thank you to our panelists today.